All right, let's get to that uh, breaking news story then. Unfortunately, it is with re uh, regards to coronavirus. So they've actually caught him. They, Alistair, of course, uh, a part of your briefing, you told us. The Western Cape Health Department says a strike and subsequent shortage of healthcare workers is the last thing the province needs. It's been scary. It's been daunting because I think um, the nature of our jobs is to always put on a brave face. This morning, uh, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases confirmed that a suspected case of COVID-19 has tested positive. It is emotionally depleting and, you know, um, because you go through these stories um, day by day and you don't, like you were saying, sometimes you don't get time to debrief. The National Coronavirus Command Council has decided to enforce a nationwide lockdown for 21 days. Many of them very disappointed. Hi, I'm Naledi Khatebe. I'm 29 years old and I've been tested positive for coronavirus COVID-19. Some of the things that we do could be seen as stupid. I mean, you hear that someone tested positive and you want to go and interview them. You want to speak to them. You want to, you want them to tell you their story. From midnight on Thursday, 26th March, until midnight Thursday, the 16th of April, all South Africans will have to stay at home. South Africa has a history of journalists going beyond the call of duty to get the story told. The class of 2020 stands on the shoulders of Nat Nagasa, who refused to be told by the apartheid government which stories to tell and how to tell them. He fiercely fought for the right to have a free voice and to speak on behalf of the voiceless. He paid a heavy price. Exile. You can imagine for a young Nat Nagasa having to leave the country on an exit permit, to leave the country of your birth, um, but you can see that what also would have pushed him is that longing um, to enjoy the freedom to tell his stories. Because you can imagine that in that, at that time being curtailed um, from the freedom of expressing yourself and telling the story of South Africa in a manner um, that you would want to. And I think the, 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 the bravery there comes out in terms of the harassment that journalists faced and also going out of the country um, as he did um, to settle in the United States. And of course, we know of his uh, tragic ending, but I think that it is that spirit um, that explains why, after all these years, I mean, uh, SANEF has had the Net Nagasa Awards since 1998. After all these years, we continue to reward excellence in journalism. And it's not even about the money, because the prize money, actually, is very tiny compared to others. But I think the significance of the award is what carries more resonance um, for our journalists. This particular time of conversation brings us to something that was very close to my heart, and that is the man called Nat Nakasa. As we celebrate great journalism, we also look at the contribution of a young man who had the wisdom beyond his years and who was able to set forth a journey and a legacy that remains with us today. What Nat stood for is the injustices that were happening at the time, you know, during apartheid. And what he wanted to do was, through journalism, is to fight and be the voice of those people that could not speak for themselves. Nat Nakasa inspired a generation of South African journalists who had to fight hard during the apartheid years to make sure South Africans and the world knew about the human rights abuses under an oppressive regime. We remember a not-so-distant apartheid past where um, journalists were jailed for doing their work and exposing the atrocities and the evilness of the apartheid system. They were stupid enough, uh, like I was, to choose to be a journalist. You were choosing to go into a career uh, where the police were going to be constantly on your tail. It's 
it's important to say that um, you know people did fight back. There was this incredible um, flowering of journalism in terms of the alternative media, but of course those journalists were were, were of course threatened. And post apartheid, there's been a huge amount of freedom. I mean, our constitution is incredible in terms of what it protects. Um, we have Section 16 that protects freedom of expression, freedom of the media. I think to be a good journalist in South Africa today, you really need to have the guts to pursue the story until its very end. It's not always easy because we find many, many, many roadblocks that are hitting us constantly. But I think we've got to have the guts, we've got to have the determination. Freedom of speech had to be a constant struggle. When you speak truth to power, power doesn't always like it. The media is often the only voice that holds our government to account. But of course there are red flags. We worry about the increased incidence of police attacking journalists, threatening journalists. We worry around uh, things like the secrecy bill, which uh, we've fought tooth and nail against uh, because it threatened to put journalists in jail for writing about whatever the state would have deemed to be confidential. We continue to fight against that. We're here today to stand in solidarity with them. The other thing which is really important to talk about is, of course, the fact that so much has moved online. Um, and so journalists are on social media um, and journalists have opinions and they put those opinions out there and they're very brave um, about a lot, of, a lot of the things that they're saying. And when they're holding uh, powerful people uh, to account, those powerful people don't like it. And over the last few years, we have seen many attacks, particularly on female journalists. Female journalists have been hugely harassed. I mean, they've been trolled. Um, the language that has been used against them has been extraordinarily vicious. Around the streets here. Uh, in, uh, it, it is not an easy job. You know, uh, as journalists, we don't expect people to love us, but we do at least want in a democratic state a healthy debate. Uh, so let's deal with the issues and not attack uh, individuals. In March 2020, the first COVID-19 case was reported in South Africa, and it changed our lives. For the first time in our history, the whole country was in lockdown. Journalists, considered essential workers to keep South Africans informed, had a new story to tell. They had to find new ways to tell it. She will notice that I am now wearing an N95 mask. I have a surgical gown, gloves, and as you can see there, my, my feet are covered. So I'm a political reporter. Um, usually, you know, you're chasing politicians, ANC. DA, you know, Freedom Front Plus, but then COVID came and, you know, I had to put on a hat that I, I never knew I had, a health reporter's hat. Um, and, you know, I've been running with COVID since we reported one of our few first cases. I felt like it's pushed me to the boundaries to tell stories in a different way. It's pushed me to get voices of people out that, that, that would otherwise be voiceless. So as much as it's been hor horrific, it's also been, um, it's been an eye opener for me. Now has been the time for journalists to come and mostly update the people about what the virus is. A lot of people were unaware of what it is, you know, and to let people know what the virus is, but also to remove the stigma associated with it. COVID's changed everything. So that's just the reality. It's changed our personal lives, it's changed our professional lives, and it's changed reporting a lot. It's changed, it's changed some very basics and fundamentals of journalism. That, that connection that you often get with people when you're out in the field, where you're talking to people face to face without a mask inhibiting you, where you can see somebody's face and you can really tell their emotions. But now we've got masks and we've got visors, so it's changed everything.
it kind of showed up the resilience. It showed how people and, and colleagues wanted to tell the story. Um, I think this is the one story you want to be part of if you're a journalist in these times. You want to tell your grandchildren or your you know friends one day what you did during the okay. COVID-19 yeah. and during the lockdown. And I think, you know, it's it was just amazing to, for me to see, despite the, the risk of, of being infected, of going out, um, how people just stayed up. The newsroom, you know, everyone wanted to be part of the story. Story. Everyone wants to be able to tell this. Every time they're out somewhere, there's a potential of being infected. And we have seen journalists being infected while on duty. We have seen journalists die. It's been a tough week for us here at ENCA. Cameraman Lungile Tom passed away, a victim of COVID-19. Based in Cape Town, Lungile was a fearless journalist, a loving husband and a magnificent father. And we will miss him. We knew that we were going to be in the front line. We knew that we were going to be at very high risk. And we kind of knew the pattern of someone contracting the virus. So I had started experiencing mild symptoms, mild flu symptoms. Um, and it, it, it's, it's interesting because it happened at a time where we had dust long colleagues. Um, in Cape Town, he is the first video journalist to pass away after contracting COVID-19. And we're still mourning his loss when I started feeling flu-like symptoms. And then I decided to inform my editors, and then we made a collective decision to go get tested. Everyone here at Newsroom Africa incredibly worried. I have no doubt that you have had so many viewers worried as well. Take us through the last fortnight or so. You speak about... And um, it, it, I kind of knew that I would test positive. I was mentally prepared for it. I was ready to, to do everything that I can to recover from the virus, and I subsequently did. COVID-19 is a killer virus. I decided to make my status public because of the negative stigma attached to the virus. And that's where I went from being an individual worried about dying of a virus to journalism kicking in, saying to myself, actually use this to try to destigmatize COVID-19. I'm much more compassionate after having COVID-19. I understand people's fears about getting this virus. And I think we need to respect those fears because of what this virus has done. So with the COVID epidemic, since our first case came to South Africa on March 5th, we haven't been doing any reporting other than COVID. It's really literally been months of that. And we've had very few breaks. I personally haven't taken a break of a single day, not even a weekend since then. Because things change so quickly, where we previously could have worked on a story for two weeks, the time frame would now be three or four days. I've got to say, it's a totally different environment here in the newsroom. Um, what was once a bustling and vibrant environment with journalists shouting at each other and swearing and begging each other to share the newspapers on time has now become a bit of a scene from a Western movie where you're expecting tumbleweed to start flowing through the office. Every day when you go to the office, you know that now I need to put on my braveness coat because it's not every story that you tell that people are going to be happy with. So we're going to receive those threats. But now you know why you started. You know why you wanted to become a journalist, to tell the stories of people, whether you put your life at risk, but a story needs to be told. For me, it was important to um, do gender-based violence cases and stories because now we realize that the escape for many um, victims of gender-based violence is no longer there. They were basically um, held ransom by, by their abusers. When the lockdown was announced, people were stranded in, in different parts of the world, battling desperate to get home. And they were basically running out of money relaying their feelings, relaying their emotions, relaying their devastation and their desperate plea to get back to their children, to their spouses, to their parents, was just the most devastating thing for me. And I felt like, and I feel like sometimes it's important to feel that way because it helps you tell those real stories. It helps you to dig deep and find the courage to explain um, exactly what these people are going through. 
I was I was covering a story recently about a family that buried a wrong a wrong corpse. Or yes, should I call it a corpse? Yes. So I was I was covering that story and I walked into a mortuary where a positive body was kept and my heart pumped because I was like, what am I doing? What I mean, you know, what am I doing here? Why, why am I here? But then quickly you, you get into a, a zone where you say, the people out there need to know. The people out there need to know that COVID is serious. COVID is killing people. Then I pursued. I pursued the story and, you know, we led with it on the front page of the Soweto newspaper. But COVID-19 doesn't only present a physical and health challenge to the media. It also challenges its very existence. A strained financial situation before COVID-19 has now become an impending disaster. If we are not paying attention, COVID-19 could also um, signal the end of the media as well. Because a lot of organizations are shutting down, journalists are doing so. We are actually the essential workers that no one pays attention to. Currently, obviously, with the COVID-19, the biggest threat to journalism is the sustainability of media houses. It is just absolutely heartbreaking to find out that, you know, a whole lot of us will be losing our jobs, a whole lot of us will, will not be having income for the next couple of years. And knowing that South Africa right now is also dealing with high levels of unemployment, it's, it's very disappointing, it's very disheartening but we, we just hope for the best. COVID did bring complete madness because you already had a very fragile media industry uh, that was already under huge threat. Um, it was under huge threat in terms of its financing. Um, the, the print media was um, hugely under threat already. Um, and now you suddenly had a situation where um, journalists were out on the front line where everybody else was locked up. Um, they were emergency workers. And also um, then from the financial side, you had a problem because um, the small amount of advertising that was going into, into the media was now even less because, you know, no one was buying anything. Our company recently announced retrenchments, so that's, that's a bit of a hard one to take at the moment. I think we're all feeling that. The stranglehold now under COVID is showing us that journalism is under threat. We're under a different kind of threat. We're under a threat where com commercial imperatives have forced media owners to cut back and the biggest chunk of this is affecting the newsroom at the stage that we have this conversation 700 journalists have lost their jobs but going forward in the next few months this is going to run into thousands uh, many of the community newspapers have been hard hit um, I think that community radio has also been hard hit. The future of, of, of community media uh, in South Africa um, uh, looks, at the moment with the COVID, uh, things are bad. And I hear the thing about um, newsrooms shrinking, but it cannot hamper our ability to do our work. And that's a primary consideration. Um, so if the newsroom, in their process of shrinking, we are not considering what's the core of our work, then it becomes a problem. The future of journalism is going to be such that it's going to be a lot more difficult for people to survive and to find jobs in the industry in South Africa, for example. So it is going to be tough. But I think it is a case of people who are able to innovate who are able to, to look at journalism in a new way and move away from this old idea of, you know, so-called traditional media um, that are going to be able to continue to, to speak truth to power, as I've said, because I always think that there will be a need for journalists. We cannot afford to have the industry die. I only have one country. I'm a citizen of South Africa and nowhere else. And it's important that we get things right here. So I need to ask the right questions here because I have nowhere else to go. I can't, I can't decide that I'm going to uproot my family and take it elsewhere. This is all I have and this is my home. So it rests on my conscience to make the right decisions to make sure that 
we cover South Africa the way it should be covered. The public knows the things that it needs to know. We can't escape the reality of South Africa as an industry. I always say when you have the economy as depressed as ours is, and people unemployed and struggling, and somebody has to choose between buying a newspaper and buying bread, they will choose bread. So we are part and parcel of, you know, experiencing this reality that is South Africa. But we can turn the corner. We have to continue shouting and demanding and fighting for those in power to do the right thing. Looking at the bravery of most journalists, especially in the last five years, fear is no longer there. We, we, we go into the office of the president and ask them for that. And so I think we are embracing what Nectar Casa wanted to do, to say, I cannot be intimidated or I cannot just be bullied out of what I want to do. He, he strongly believed in his, his, his profession, his career, and he tied it to how the situation was at the time. For the mainstream journalists to be there at all times in the front lines, giving us the, 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 the facts of what is really happening, you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's, it's, it's something to be proud of. For a moment in our time, under all of the sadness, we come together and the light shines on a connection between the journalists of today, journalism of today, and that one great firebrand called Nat Nakasa, who, in his time, was doing the very same thing that the journalists of today are doing. I think journalists have shown immense bravery and resilience during this time of COVID-19. Um, and I think, you know, they are all deserving of the Nat Nakasa Award. Every journalist who went out there to cover a hospital, to speak to, to people at risk, um, to, to speak to people who don't have food, who are at risk of running out of food and who, who have had their livelihoods taken away. Um, you know, to speak to them firstly in an empathetic way, but also to tell those stories, to bring them to the public, to give a full picture of the massive um, you know seismic impact of this virus on our our current affairs but also on the future that we have because of this bravery the net nakasa prize is this year awarded to all journalists in south africa an award supported by sanif's corporate partner sunlam bravery that sits behind you know all of these journalists that have been awarded you know the net nakasa award for example uh, demonstrates the, the critical role that they've played in, in our society and the betterment uh, of life. To our partner Sandlam, that has shown tremendous commitment to media freedom and to journalism for continuing to partner with us to honour this great man, Net Nakasa, that leaves us a legacy of bravery and courage and that we must never be silenced. Journalism is a fundamental part of any society. And there's no more important time than now in South Africa for us to be telling really important stories and for us to be telling the story of South Africa. To every other journalist in this country who are continuing to brave um, danger, heading out there every day to tell the story of South Africa. We say congratulations to all of you. We are proud of you. It may be tough. It is difficult. We have suffered some losses, but this is the time for us to be even stronger and to push forward and ensuring that we tell the story of South Africa. Well done.